Welcome to the night studio at the museum. My name is Allison Druin, and I'm a professor in the iSchool at the University of Maryland and chief futurist in the office of uh, the vice president for research. I'm here today with, a, uh, as director of the Future of Information Alliance with Ira Chinoy, uh, who is associate dean of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the university. The Future of Information Alliance was launched at the University of Maryland uh, in 2011 to be a catalyst for interdisciplinary collaboration, discussion, research, and action on important issues related to the evolving role of information in our lives. In addition to broad engagement on campus, we have 10 amazing founding partners off campus. We're excited to be here today uh, with this program, which is hosted by one of these amazing partners, the museum, made possible by support from the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation and the University of Maryland. Today's program is a part of a week of events put together by the Alliance and all of our 10 partners um, to explore what we are calling the future of the past. This is essentially about um, the theme of of where we are endangering, uh, losing, and forgetting, and neglecting our information. There's an information explosion, and we are in danger of losing all of the information we are finding. So today's program uh, is about the unparalleled challenges that we're facing now with this rapid expansion of content across all forms of media uh, going on around us today. Preservation and management of born digital and other materials faces an array of obstacles. These are technical, legal, social, cultural, financial. And these will be discussed today by the innovators we have here. Um, they work in searchable audio, the archiving of social movements, um, and the evolution of tools for finding stuff uh, on the web. Uh, in a sense, uh, we're here today to wrestle with the problems that you know, will crop up for future historians as they try to make sense of what's going on today. Uh, we also want to let you know that in addition to those of you who are here, we've had a sizable audience all week uh, out in cyberspace. And uh, we have, for those of you who are watching this as a live stream, if you want to contribute uh, questions or comments, we are monitoring that. Uh, you can find those links on our website, fia.umd.edu. Uh, and you can Twitter with the hashtag uh, FIAUMD, two hashtags, FIAUMD and hashtag future of the past. Uh, you can send an email to fia at cs.umd.edu, uh, or you can join the Future of Information Alliance community on Google+. Today's moderator is Paul Sparrow, uh, Senior Vice President for Broadcasting and New Media here at the Museum. He oversees the museum's website, social media networks, interactive exhibits, and video production, and has been our FIA liaison over the past two years. As an Emmy Award-winning television producer, he's created more than 300 hours of primetime programming and more than a dozen documentaries and network specials. But before we turn the program over to Paul, we are going to hear from Jim Duff. He is the president and CEO of the, of the Freedom Forum, which among other things operates this wonderful museum. And we are also grateful to him for hosting the FIA, FIA here twice over the past two years for two amazing programs. Jim Duff. Thank you very much, Allison and Ira. It's, uh, I'm delighted to be with you here today, and we are really privileged and pleased to host this and partner with the University of Maryland. Uh, it's really right up our alley in what we like to do here, and that is preserve as much as we can in the way of uh, information for historical purposes and display it here. Uh, we educate the public about uh, the First Amendment and uh, this whole topic is of utmost interest to us uh, as uh, we try to ascertain how we're going to preserve the abundance of information that's going to be that is available in this digital age. So it's a perfect uh, marriage, if you will, of uh, two great organizations, ours here at the museum and the University of Maryland. And uh, with that brief introduction, I don't want to stand in the way of a, an outstanding program that you'll have in front of you today. I do want to introduce a very good friend of ours, uh, Lucy Doglish, who is the 
dean of the Philip Merrill uh, College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, and has been so for the last 16 months. Uh, I'm a big fan of Lucy's. She's been uh, 12 years uh, as director of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, which is a vitally, uh, this, that was prior to her deanship at uh, Maryland. Uh, it was a vitally important association of reporters and news editors. Uh, that's dedicated to protecting First Amendment interests in the news media. Uh, and in both of these roles, she's demonstrated uh, a steadfast devotion to the importance uh, of the open flow of information in our society. Uh, so, Lucy, welcome back. It's great to have you here always. Thank you, Jim. It's, it's lovely to be back at the museum. And on behalf of everyone at the University of Maryland, uh, thank you for hosting us here at the museum today. And thank you for joining us in, in the virtual world as well as here in the audience. Uh, we at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism and the University of Maryland are very pleased to be a strong participant in the Future of Information Alliance. Uh, as, as mentioned earlier, Ira Chinoy is my associate dean, so I have had the privilege in recent months to talk about what they were planning to do with this series of programs called The Future of the Past. I think it's a, a marvelous idea to talk about our cultural and democratic heritage. It reminded me um, that my husband and I love to go to Williamsburg around the holidays. Uh, you know, you go and, and see Jamestown, where this country was born. Uh, you go to Williamsburg and you see where democracy first flourished. Then you go to Yorktown and you see where independence uh, was won. On Sunday morning, we went to the Yorktown battlefield. And uh, we had the most amazing tour from uh, a park ranger, a National Park Service ranger by the name of Linda, who uh, did the most amazing tour that I've ever had the privilege to participate in. She was able to bring history into perspective. She was able to quote by memory letters from George Washington. She was able to talk about what had appeared in newspapers. She brought what happened at Yorktown 250 years ago to life. And what was really interesting to me about that was she had the material to work from. She, there, she was able to quote from it. She, she knew it like the back of her hand, and she made it come alive for those of us who were on the tour. Back then, as she explained, particularly to the children in the audience, you know, you couldn't quote on being able to pull out your cell phone and communicate with the folks who were up getting ready to invade New York. Uh, you had to rely on leaks and spies and communicating with riders on horseback and sending messages by ship. You never knew if they were going to make it. So it was interesting. In real time, you didn't really know what was going on. But yet, what they did have has been preserved. And it strikes me that that is such a contrast to what we have for today. Because we can communicate with each other instantaneously and know what's happening at any given moment. But are we going to know 100 years from now what was happening right now? So I'm interested in hearing how Paul Sparrow and our distinguished experts are going to explain to us how we are going to preserve our cultural and democratic heritage. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you to our panel. We'll get to introducing them in a moment. Uh, but uh, to start, we wanted to give you some context of where we are today. This is truly the golden age of creative communication. Never has uh, the technology provided the tools for our individuals to create the kinds of um, art and photography and personal expression that you're seeing going on today. Uh, and it's impossible to even get your mind around the volume of material that's being created. I'm going to show you some numbers, and like everything associated with the web, I don't believe any of them. But they will at least give you some context. And because these are a couple of uh, months old, they're no longer accurate. But we'll start by saying that um, YouTube, 72 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every 60 seconds. 
So all of these numbers I'm going to give you are things that happen on the Internet in 60 seconds. Dan has already corrected me. He says this is already up to 100 hours of video every 60 seconds uploaded to YouTube. Um, on Facebook, you have 2.4 million posts happening every 60 seconds and 1.8 million likes. As I'm talking, that went up to 1.9 million likes. 2.0 million likes. Oh, wait, no, I'm... Um, on Flickr, which is a photography site, uh, you have 20 million photos being viewed every 60 seconds. Um, on Twitter, you have 278,000 tweets. Uh, and that, these are average numbers, but in 60 seconds, 278,000 tweets. How do you keep track of that? How do you archive that? How do you figure out which of those 278,000 tweets are relevant and which are not? Instagram, which is really based almost entirely on, on mobile phones, um, you're having 36,000 photos are uploaded every 60 seconds. And on Tumblr, which is a blogging format, you have 70,000 new photos being posted every 60 seconds. So think about that volume every minute, every hour, every day, and those numbers are just going up in an almost algorithmic progression. So the question is, how do you sustain that? How do you keep track of your own personal content? whether it's your personal photographs, whether it's the things you're posting on Facebook. And how does the government, uh, the Library of Congress, sort through that? They have a massive project now to archive the, the Twitter feeds out there. How do you even sort it and organize it and understand what's important and what's not? So we're going to try to address some of those issues today with our panel, which, is, which has been very interesting for me as I've studied these people and learned more about them because they represent three very, very different perspectives on the challenge that, are, that faced us today. One is that what do you do with things that existed in the past that you're trying to move forward in audio? One is how do you document real-time events? And the third is how do you find this stuff once it's out there? So we're going to start with Ann Wooten, who is the co-founder of Pop-Up Archive, which is an audio archiving system, a platform to help uh, sort of create tools to help people uh, archive and find sound, uh, which is very, very difficult. You can't do search for it. It's, it exists in its own universe. Um, she's at the California uh, um, School of Information at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, she worked with the Public Radio Exchange before that. Um, Howard Besser is the film professor at the Uni New York University and has been very involved with the uh, Occupy Project um, and the activist archivists. And he'll be talking about uh, he'll be talking about that. And then Dan Russell, who is the director of user happiness. I really want a title like that. I mean, who doesn't want a title? Director of user happiness uh, at Google. Uh, he's been with the Future of Information Alliance from the beginning, and he's now the futurist in residence at the University of Maryland. Um, and his, he offers a uh, massively uh, open online course on search and advanced search. And I believe he's reached 300,000 people uh, with these online courses. But uh, we're going to start with Anne, and she's going to talk about uh, what she's done with Pop-Up Archive and the challenges in, in trying to collect, analyze, and make useful the sounds of the world around us. Thank you, Paul. Um, so you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to focus pretty exclusively on sound here, but I hope that it will be a, a useful lens as we think about uh, some of the larger uh, future of information issues at stake here. Um, I thought uh, before I dive completely into my slides, we can start with the, with the first one. Um, I would, it actually would be helpful for me to see it on the monitor, I think, because I'm going to have to advance them myself. Um, tell you a little bit about how I got started doing this in the first place. Um, my co-founder, Bailey, and I uh, of Pop-Up Archive both grew up um, as aspiring journalists. Um, we admittedly had surfed the net before high school, but very much see ourselves as coming from an analog age. We envisioned ourselves as newspaper people with reporters' pads and pencils, and um, uh, we're, we're passionate about archival media, enthusiastic about the shift that we saw happening from analog to digital, but we're consternated by the changing technological landscape and um, the, the state of the industry. And I don't know if you can see that photo now, but it's, it's not actually um, oh yeah, okay, great. There we go. Um, so, uh, old media, analog media. This is not actually a picture of Bailey and myself, um, <laughs> but uh, you get the idea. And so we saw um, the, a shift happening from histor historical journalism um, to the future of journalism, which looks a little bit more like 
uh, the gobbledygook machine readable text that you see here and probably don't want to have much to do with. But it led us to the Berkeley School of Information because we thought that um, to understand the future of journalism, it might help us to understand um, just exactly what all of that XML means so that you and content creators and journalists don't necessarily have to. Um, we started out pretty early on working with the Kitchen Sisters, who you see in this picture here, and that's what really got us into recorded sound preservation and access. Um, the Kitchen Sisters are a pair of San Francisco-based radio producers who have been working in public media for over 30 years. They've had hundreds of pieces on NPR, various series. They've collected thousands of hours of interviews from um, all corners of the world, people of all different walks of life through partnerships and collaborations with oral history archives, other producers, uh, universities, scholars, uh, all sorts of people. And they, they um, made us wake up very quickly to the reality of um, content creator, producer workflows and habits in newsrooms um, and the ways in which those do not necessarily line up with uh, archival standards or preservation guidelines. Um, so, the picture that you see here is, uh, in many ways, a, a summary of recorded sound, a, a, a short history in one photo of recorded sound. You see reels, there are cassette tapes, stats, um, mini discs, CDs, and even down in that corner on the right there was a hard drive that is a pretty old hard drive. Um, and I can actually tell you that the, this is material from the Kitchen Scissors collection. They're in the practice of saving old casings so that they can pop the old drives in and out of those casings in order to access the audio on them. What that means is that a cassette tape is actually harder to lose than a WAV file these days or an MP3. Um, the, it's, it's the shoeboxes that um, we were sh stuffing cassettes and, and CDs into over the years in some ways uh, are, are better preserved than a, a digital audio file created yesterday. Now, it's true that there are some really great institutional archives out there. Um, this is the WGBH Open Vault archive site where they have incredible content from uh, the March on Washington, the Civil Rights Movement. But any of these institutions use different, all of the institutions use different language uh, to talk about what they're describing. So for as streamlined and user-friendly as this site might look, the data underneath is all kinds of messy and it's really hard to get it out um, for use by, by other people, uh, short of finding it through the site. Um, so uh, we've, we realized that um, the complaint we were hearing from everyone we talked to um, in, individuals and institutions alike was that they didn't want to pay the future tax of archiving up front. They knew that it was important in principle. They knew one day they would regret not having done it. But as you probably um, would also agree, you, you, you think you're going to clean up your desktop one day. You think you're going to get to organizing all those photos on your iPhone. But um, some, of, some, of the, some of the best among us might actually get around to it. Most don't. Um, so uh, not only a question of making archiving more a part of the production workflow, if, if we're not willing to pay the future tax up front, how do we make it a part of what we're already doing, um, was a major area of inquiry for us in grad school. Um, helping people speak the same language, um, again, ideally without having to try too hard. Uh, so you know what um, uh, MLK and Martin Luther King are the same thing to me, right? To a machine, they're completely different things. Um, and then more fundamentally, um, we realized that uh, because of the changing st state of technology, um, preservation and smart preservation practices are incredibly important, but finding this sound is still hard when it's stored even on the most secure servers because they're opaque files uh, stored in folder directory structures, and that's about it. You can search by file name and not much else. So. Um, with, the, with speech to text technology ad advancing the way it, that it is, we realize that we, we are um, sort of at the, at the precipice in, in a positive way of being able to literally find a single sentence within our archives. Um, and so uh, that is what led us to uh, build Pop-Up Archive, which I will tell you about in just a moment. Um, but first I just wanted to back up a little bit and uh, address a, a, a nagging question that may be in the back of some people's minds. 
We've all seen the headlines, radio is dead, broadcast media is dead, isn't radio in its death throes? And the answer is, of course it's not. Radio's not dying. Um, we're a little tired. I say we, like the royal we, but I, I'm pretending Bailey is here with me right now. Um, you know, we saw a headline the other day about the death of the lullaby. I think that this is actually just a lazy journalism tactic at some point because lullabies aren't dying. And um, the spirit of the radio plays a huge role in the way we consume news and entertainment. Um, you can't really argue with the fact that there are almost a million people downloading each episode of This American Life. There are over 20 million members on SoundCloud, which is one of the premier sound distribution platforms, channels on the web today. Um, radio is uh, definitively not dying. Uh, I think the spirit of radio lives on. And the reason that that question even gets posed is because we have consumed the internet to, up until now, I would say, largely um, through devices that have screens, and we watch those screens. And so Netflix and YouTube are obvious examples of that. Um, but uh, in increasingly, um, as, as you know, broadcast industries do tremble, the internet is moving onto our phones and into our pockets. Um, and the reality is that I can't wash my dishes while I'm watching YouTube or Netflix. Maybe my dishes. Definitely can't drive a car or go for a run. Um, and so what that means is that it's audio's turn now. Um, I think there's going to be a renaissance. There is a renaissance happening of audio on the web uh, through some of the services that you see here um, because it's in our pockets. It's on our phones. Um, and even more than that, um, maybe not more, but in, in, in companionship with that, um, because the web has been so video-centric uh, as opposed to audio, um, journalists and uh, scholars are going to sources like YouTube to find archival audio content, to find audio for repurposing and reuse, um, uh, or within a newsroom using tacit knowledge, the memories of the people who may work there and tomorrow may not. Um, but there's no single good place to, to find and search and find audio on the web. Um, so, yes, we need to make sound plastic, parsable, and findable. Um, that's a quote from Clive Thompson at Wired, um, who calls sound the final frontier on the web. Uh, and I agree with him about that. Um, and it's not a question. I started out talking about preservation, and uh, we'll come back to it. And I imagine we all, we all will talk about it more today. Um, like I said, smart preservation is really important, um, but there are increasingly places where you can do that, and um, we're, we're all preventing the digital apocalypse to the best degree possible, and there are um, absolutely guidelines to follow along those lines. But once you've figured out the storage, it's not really a question of what to store or how you choose what to store. Uh, storage is just getting cheaper. It's a question of retrieval. It's a question of how you find it. Um, how you go from these opaque media formats like audio files this particular image is a um, screenshot of a file folder directory someone took from their computer, printed out, cut out, and then taped to the side of a hard drive for a quick and easy access. Um, and we can definitely do better than that. So that's what led us to build Pop-Up Archive. We uh, finished grad school at um, the Berkeley School of Information and um, have been funded by the Knight Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities and are working with the Public Radio Exchange um, on this platform of simple tools to help journalists and archivists organize, manage, and search their sounds. Um, and preservation is absolutely a part of that. So whether this is a page where you can um, browse by different metadata facets, refine sounds based on the, the people speaking in them, the places that are mentioned within them, um, the proper nouns and topics that they cover. Um, it's also a, a place, like I said, for, for managing sounds, for uh, organizing audio in a way beyond that traditional file folder structure. Um, and uh, perhaps most excitingly, in some ways, um, when we, from a futurist's perspective at least, uh, the automated transcription and keyword extraction that we're doing takes audio files and processes them so that we come up with basically a big bag of words that we then analyze um, for, like I said, people's names, places, topics, 
uh, to add extra semantic context to the audio and to make it so that you know when we search Google, as we'll hear a lot about in just a few minutes, we um, know that the results that come up on a given page are going to um, be relevant to the term that we entered. Uh, the same it can't quite be said for audio. Even, and even if you find an audio file, um, I'm wait we're waiting for the day when, when audio results come up in Google, right? But even when you find that audio file, um, <laughs> To, to skim through to the 18-minute mark where the word you're looking for might appear, it's not possible right now. You'd have to listen to that audio file to know uh, what's actually deep down inside it. Um, so some quick examples we can run through. Uh, historical throwbacks, Churchill. Um, the search results you hear might be hard to, to read the details of, but I can just run you through it. There are facets like the ones I described, the, the interviewers, interviewees on the left-hand side, the search results are listed there with, in highlighted in blue, the time-stamped moment in the audio file where that word or phrase appears. So if we then click through to some of the results. I'm constantly refreshed by remembering what Mr. Winston Churchill once said when he said that democracy was the very worst form of government ever devised by the mind of man except for every other form of government. We got a couple of just uh, sound clips that are coming up from from the public archive. This is sound that we process actually from the University of Illinois. Um, oh, uh, station. It's in been my class, decades. I told the students how Winston Churchill read this in the dark days, 1940, when you get the idea. Uh, Hitler was. And then a slightly more contemporary example: teenager. Timestamp search results, and then audio. Yes, they're hostile. Certainly, and they're angry and often surly. But the teenager who grows up in a slum may learn more about the transactions of the marketplace there for us. than an honors Moving graduate. Right along. Yeah, so my story basically is about me and my relationship with my parents at the time when I was coming out and kind of struggling with being an openly gay teenager and being from a Catholic family where being gay can be you know, construed as being evil or being... So you get the idea. You know. And that ma those results were coming from um, material that is being shared with the public, that's public archival material, but the same can be said internally for newsrooms and media organizations that are looking, like I said, we've watched in so many beta tests, user, user research, journalists scrubbing through audio files looking for the moment, the salient point that they need to get out for web production or for blogging, and they're wasting tons of, of precious time. So. When we can easily index and organize the sound, um, it makes workflows quicker. It uh, reveals latent patterns in audio, like, like some of what you just saw. Um, and it gives us access to new source material. There was an episode from the radio show Radio Diaries you just heard, archival material from the University of Illinois. Um, we've been doing work with the Pacifica Radio Archives uh, and a lot of other uh, previously completely siloed audio collections. Um, I think looking toward the future and thinking about tools that are going to be most useful for, for audio archiving in particular going forward, um, uh, I think in summary, audio has been locked up in, in like I said, silos or black boxes in the past. Um, and even now, born digitally, it's locked up in proprietary systems a lot of the time. And I think that that uh, needs to and, and is changing. Um, we want to open the door for new types of audio innovation on the web, and I think doing that requires harnessing the, the different types of innovative web services out there um, so that it's not uh, a, a 50 login process. Um, so, for example, um, Pacific Radio Archives, I mentioned, we've been working with them, and Amara, which is a crowdsourcing platform for transcription and translation, and we're getting people from around the world to contribute. Uh, in, uh, Turkish and Italian translations of this radio material, interviews with Buster Keaton and Janis Joplin. Um, people from around the world are hearing these sounds that otherwise were locked up in Los Angeles until quite recently. Um, the Internet Archive, um, I wish I could say I'm their number one fan. I would fight for that title. <laughs> um, they are building a public library of the Internet um, for, for anyone who hasn't heard of them and uh, will take any uh, public audio that people want to save, and we've partnered with them to try to get as much material up um, in, in a public trust as possible, free of, free of charge. And then SoundCloud, I mentioned before, is another example of a really great distribution platform for sharing audio. A lot of different types of individuals and organizations are experimenting with it. 
um, and, and hopefully finding new audiences that way, um, or at the very least engaging with their existing audiences in new ways. Um, and then I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's, um, the possibilities are endless. <laughs> um, but there are, are all sorts of, if anyone is interested, um, there's a project called Hyper Audio. Um, it's hyperaud.io, and Mark Boaz is the guy behind that. He's working on some really amazing tools to uh, edit uh, audio and video on the web, which he certainly is not the only one, but looking at ways that um, we can marry the text to the audio or video, as the case may be, and, um, and be able to, uh, to create really amazing web, web content in ways that we haven't before. Um, so I will cut it off there, but no man is an island, and I think that the, the future of archival audio is in breaking down those silos between academia and old media organizations and web services. Um, and this is just the beginning, so thank you. So before we move on to Howard, uh, we're going to see if there's any questions from the audience or if any questions have come in from our um, uh, fan base out there in uh, Webland. Uh, do we have any social media questions or any questions from the audience? We have a microphone here that we'll send around and um, get the audience from the question, uh, question from the audience. Yeah. Uh, first, I would like to appreciate this panel. It's great. Uh, but uh, what, uh, my question is, you cannot just use uh, the uh, available data. You think you can get access to it because a lot of information are suppressed, uh, buried, or burned. You know, that's just like that's, uh, racial profiling, they don't only just uh, this rob your car or rob your resources, but also rob your documents. So if you have complaint, uh, a document like that, they bury, and then even in the city attorney office or county, or they detect home, and there's no complaint resolution or no even fact. And in fact, they're just like core personnel, they can create a false documents or false information and has a false charges. So this kind of relation, we have to stop that and ask them to have prosecution and investigation. And now we have high tech and a lot of petition site, they manipulate in such a way it's not working. So I hope Google and Facebook and LinkedIn, they can investigate those because they don't allow people to have their voice. So if they are doing like this, they really distortion of our history. So we have to rewrite our history, and revolution is necessary. We have to go on this direction. Do you have a question? My question is, yes, it's, you know, this panelist and then the moderator, if we can have an effort, if we can really put an effort to prosecute, uh, ask the government to really prosecute this kind of fraudulent criminal network operation. So we have a choose rather than all the recycle of false information. So the question I think is how do we um, enforce accuracy on the web? Uh, people who are, how do we prosecute people who are putting out false information? Um, uh, the, there is an enormous amount of inaccurate information on the web. I think understanding what's accurate and what's not is a challenge and I think the same is true for audio archives. I mean there's a lot of stuff out there that people said on the radio that yeah, yeah. Well, and it goes way beyond audio archives too. And the Internet Archive is actually a good example of the, the Wayback Machine is um, one initiative that they have where they're scraping web pages going back, you know, 15, going on 20 years, um, at the very least. So that, and there's actually been some question about whether or not those pages can be used in court cases as evidence for information that has since been covered up by the by the the, the company that maintained that site. Um, so I think that would be my first um, sort of hopeful answer to, to an, an effort with a fair amount of groundswell behind it that's trying to document these things so that they can't be rewritten or um, mischaracterized in the future. I know Tim Berners-Lee, who helped develop the code underlying the World Wide Web, has been working on a way to create algorithms that look at authority, look at accuracy for websites, so that every website would have a, a ranking or a rating that gave you its credibility rating based on the other sites that link to it but it's an incredibly complex uh, challenge, and I don't think they've come up with a solution. So we're going to move on now to Howard Besser, professor of cinema studies at New York University. Uh, the Library of Congress named him a digital preservation pioneer. Uh, I'm not sure whether that means they wanted to preserve him 
<laughs> but but um, there was a big conference, and he, he was a digital preservation pioneer. He's done some truly extraordinary work on, in many different areas. Um, and one of the few people that's worked at uh, UCLA and Berkeley and NYU and Stanford, and I can't even make the list, it's so long. Um, but one of the things we want to uh, ask him to talk about today was the Occupy movement was really a seminal event in uh, sort of a, a new form of citizen journalism. Things were happening in these environments, in these communities in New York and in other cities around the world. They were being documented using cell phones and, and all sorts of very ephemeral technologies. And with, along with a group called the Activist Archivists, they started a campaign to try to document it. So Howard, if you would talk about this, I, I think this is truly fascinating. Okay, um, thank you, Paul. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction and, and, and kind of scene setting. Uh, uh, let's put on the slides and, and I'll start talking. Um, so uh, I'm really talking about uh, preservation and access of this kind of user-generated media, uh, much of it generated from uh, uh, through social networks, some of it not, uh, but all related to this social movement. And I want to put this in the context of how that could be useful, not just not solely for social movements, but for other things as well. Uh, so I'm going to go through why we should look at Occupy. I'll go through some projects that uh, activist archivists, the group that uh, that I'm with, uh, did, and some projects that NYU's uh, uh, archive, uh, uh, the Tamament Collection, uh, uh, has uh, has done. Um, so we all remember the Occupy movement, right? Um, this is Occupy Wall Street uh, in uh, uh, October of 2011, about a month after it started. Uh, this is Occupy Times Square uh, the same month. This is the Occupy Wall Street at Zuccotti Park. This is the, actually the library of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, here's another shot of the library. Um, this is, again, Zuccotti Park uh, uh, in uh, uh, the same month. Uh, and this is showing the kind of technology setup there, which was uh, uh, Wi-Fi service for everyone so that people could contribute their social media directly there and could look at, uh, at other people's. Um, this is Occupy Dallas in uh, um, uh, 2012. Uh, a meeting of Occupy Dallas where they're using tablets. This is, you know, tablets were fairly new then, uh, where they're using tablets to document uh, and to audio record the proceedings of, uh, uh, of the meeting. Um, this is Occupy Washington. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, McLaren Park um, uh, in uh, December of 2011. Uh, Occupy Dallas again in January of 2012. Occupy Harvard in January of 2012. Occupy Finsbury Square in London in uh, 2011, December. Ac Occupy St. Paul Church in London, same month. Occupy Bristol in the UK and Occupy Rio de Janeiro in 2011. Now, um, the kind of statistics uh, we have from Flickr, uh, they don't quite compare with the numbers that, uh, that Paul outlined earlier, but um, uh, here we're seeing uh, six months after the start of Occupy, we're seeing uh, um, uh, 630,000 uh, images on Flickr tagged with the hashtag Occupy and then, then others. Now, with all these photos and videos floating around the web, all the ones that I've shown you, um, how do we know which was taken when? I labeled these. I labeled these with what we call metadata, uh, with the date and the location. Uh, but how do we know really which was taken when? Uh, I happen to, I took all of those, so. I, I, I have my own labels on them, and I also record them uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the image itself. 
So how do we know which was taken when? How do we find the media taken before a particular crackdown uh, at that site or another? Because that may change our, uh, our understanding of what directions the movement took after a particular event or, or, or particular crackdown. And how do we know if it's OK to use uh, one of these posted photos or videos? or even to migrate it for, per, uh, for uh, preservation purposes. Um, so th those are all big questions. And to address those questions, we formed this group, uh, Activist Archivists. It's primarily uh, graduates of my master's degree program or previous programs I've been with. And we tried to address issues of preservation and access to these works. So one of the early things we did uh, was we did an experiment where we took videos with camera phones, with three different types of camera phones, and we uploaded these to services. Uh, we uploaded them to um, uh, YouTube, Google's product. We uh, uh, uploaded them to Vimeo, the paid version of Vimeo, Vimeo, the free version of Vimeo, and to the Internet Archive. So we uploaded all the, the video. We took the videos, uploaded them to these services, and then downloaded them again and looked at the settings and the metadata and the information. What we found were that date and time stamps that were attached to the original photo were generally corrupted, were generally changed that the geographic location was often not, was eliminated on these services. Um, uh, in general, what we found that at least at that point in time with, with YouTube, they replaced the date that, the, uh, uh, that the, the clip was taken with the date that it was uploaded, which may be very useful for YouTube's purposes, but for the purposes of things like our question uh, earlier, which was really about the authenticity of a work, uh, uh, or, or, or for certain types of research purposes, you really want to know the date that it was actually taken. So, um, so with this, we found um, uh, uh, very clearly that the Internet Archive preserved the file as it was. Um, that YouTube really replaced uh, most of the metadata that was there, uh, and that uh, Vimeo, if you were using the paid service for Vimeo, it kept most of the metadata, but threw out a, a little bit of it. If you were using the free service, it eliminated most of the, the information. So, so knowing that, um, and es establishing that, that, that uh, many of these social media sites strip out the uh, date, time, geographic location, uh, we decided to try and focus on trying to affect the practices of the photographers and vide videographers uh, uh, in, uh, that were taking material uh, documenting uh, the Occupy movement. And uh, for me, this was very consistent with previous findings of um, uh, of, of other projects I'd been involved in. Uh, I was involved in a five-year project from the ar archiving world about, uh, called Inner Pares II. Uh, this was an international project with about 75 researchers around the country. Uh, it took place about 10 years ago. Um, and one of the key findings uh, that we had was that digital works are more likely preservable if an archivist or uh, a librarian uh, has helped or intervened somehow in the workflow at the creation part of uh, when, the w when the work was first created. The normal thing that happens is that archives get things much later, uh, as Anne was showing those tapes, things. Uh, normally with things like that, a producer would uh, edit their tapes and uh, then create something on the air. And then, you know, five or 10 or 20 years later, they'd hand them over to the archive. Well, that worked in the analog world. That doesn't work in the digital world, as we all know with our uh, uh, 
uh, are Microsoft Word files that are over 10 years old. You can't read them. Um, so, so you have to catch it early. So you want to get in early in the life cycle. We also uh, discovered this with another project I worked on, uh, uh, preserving digital public television, um, where uh, we were actually able to, uh, as part of this very large project sponsored by Library of Congress, um, we were able to re-engineer a nightly news show, uh, World Focus, that came out of uh, WNET. And uh, we were able to get in the ground floor and do things like outfit the cameras with GPS chips. Um, the, this was an international news show. Um, and there were crews all around the world. And that they would go out and they would have GPS chips in the camera. And when they went out, before they went out uh, uh, for a story in the car on their way to a story, they would enter in information about who the talent was, about uh, who the uh, camera person was, the sound person, what the story was supposed to be. Because as uh, most journalists know, uh, trying to do that uh, after you've taken the material and you're uploading it and you want to get it on the air, there's no time to do that. So, But to have that then, to have that information stay through, even with the outtakes, having that information stay through, that was, that was all uh, clear. So, so based on this prior uh, knowledge, we developed uh, some plans with activist archivists um, to do things like give guidelines for people who are making these recordings to make their work more easily pre preservable, have them uh, make notes, turn on their GPS, upload to, pres to services that don't strip out the metadata, keep the raw footage, don't compress, things like that. So this is the Activist Archivist website. Uh, this is one of our meetings. Often I travel a lot, I give a lot of talks, so uh, I'm in, uh, on Skype there. Um, sorry, not on Google Hangout. Uh, not then. <laughs> later, 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 later meetings were, were there. Uh, and uh, here at a smaller meeting, I'm sitting on the, at the meeting on the laptop. Uh, um, so um, uh, the, 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 the projects that we uh, did, uh, um, uh, as I mentioned, the study of the metadata loss through uploading, uh, we did a number of other things, which I'll go through here. We did a very kind of uh, appropriate video to show to Occupy people that has a great narrative with drum beats and quick cutting and everything. So it's in the language and the style of Occupy and telling them why they should archive. We had an accompanying postcard that had uh, all of this information in the language of Occupy. So we, we said, why should you uh, uh, archive? Accountability. Archives collect evidence that can hold those in power accountable. So really trying to match the, the language of Occupy and the interests of, of Occupy. And um, a lot of this was also because early on in the process, when we met with uh, people from Occupy, a lot of uh, uh, the sentiment was, oh, why would you want to archive what I'm doing? I just came out to this demonstration. Uh, why would you want to take a photo of the sign I made? This sign I just, I just thought of just suddenly. Well, this isn't history. History is something else. It's not what I do. And so we, in order to counteract that, we really had to have this campaign about why you should uh, archive. Um, so, uh, you know, we talked about uh, accountability, self-determination, uh, again, all kinds of things that, 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 uh, uh, that resonated with, uh, with the language and the sentiments of Occupy. Uh, and then we put all of this on a nice, uh, cute postcard and handed it out. And um, it ended up being quite effective in kind of changing that sentiment about uh, people, why record what I'm doing. Um, uh, we also, uh, 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 one of our uh, members developed this uh, seven tips to ensure your video is usable in the long run. 
uh, to collect details while filming, keep your original raw footage unaltered, make your video discoverable with uh, uh, certain metadata that uh, indexes it in some ways, to contextualize it, make it verifiable, allow others to collect and archive it, or archive it yourself. Uh, we developed some best practices for archives and libraries and museums that actually want to co co collect the content. Uh, and we de developed this whole toolkit. We did some uh, skill shares. Um, and uh, uh, we worked with um, Creative Commons licenses to try to have uh, people positively assert that they wanted others to share uh, in, their, uh, in their work. Uh, we experimented a little bit with a tool that would allow people to blur faces, uh, 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 yeah, because that was certainly a concern that some people had. Um, and um, I, I, I'm uh, kind of running out of time here, but uh, let me just uh, uh, grab at uh, one more uh, important um, uh, idea that we did, uh, which is, um, uh, with, we worked with the daily uh, 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 group uh, called Think Tank at Occupy Wall Street. They recorded two hours every day of audio capture. We, um, NYU uh, um, Archive uh, Tamament Collection provided uh, 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 audio capture hardware to record this two hours a day, uh, six days a week. And we developed some ways to make sure that that was most retrievable and redundant ways because uh, certain things happen in real life. So the guidelines would stipulate that the person holding the recording device would check to see that time and date stamps were correct before they went out. But in fact, they ended up not doing that. Batteries run out and it resets the time and date. So we couldn't, that wasn't a reliable marker. So we also had them record a script at the beginning of each to uh, saying what date and time it was so that we could extract that. Um, and then um, uh, finally, um, the issue of, uh, of, of uh, YouTube, um, that uh, we found a way to, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, collection was actually trying uh, to um, uh, collect uh, um, uh, all the YouTubes and it wouldn't scale. So we developed a way where people uh, could, uh, the occupiers could actually vote on the best YouTube video for uh, uh, different subjects, the subject of internal workings of the organization, subject with workers, other kinds of things. Um, and uh, so that's kind of uh, a wrap and uh, I'm out of time, sorry. Well, I'll see, if, I'll see if there's any audience or social media questions in a second, but I, I want to go back to something you were talking about a little bit earlier because the metadata issue happens on, on multiple levels. There is the metadata that is used to describe what the content is, whether it's audio or a still photo or video, but then there's what we it, term metadata in the computer world, which are the keywords and the tags that are associated with web pages or things. And so there's really different, and that allows people to find it, right? The, the, the metadata that says, here's what it was December 5th, 2013 at the museum in the night studio, that's one piece of metadata, but preservation, you know, the future of the present, digital preservation, those keywords are also a kind of metadata that you want associated with that file, otherwise no one will be able to find it because they might not be searching for December 5th, 2013, the museum, they might be searching for digital preservation. So did you come up with some guidelines that help with the metadata for search as well as the metadata for understanding? Yeah, well, the, 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 the first thing to note is that we, as you well pointed out in your introduction, we're, we are in an era of exploding amounts of information. And what will not work and what will not scale to this is to have the archive that is gathering all of that together provide the indexing and the metadata. Right, it has that to just that it has to happen somewhere else. So the way in our philosophy or my personal philosophy on this is that it, it has to happen one of two places. Either it comes from the creator themselves 
or it comes from intelligent extraction tools, and certainly Google is the champion of that. I mean, can you imagine if, uh, if you were trying, uh, if Google had, instead of taking their, uh, their approach, which is to extract the words from documents and use that to index it, if they were instead going through and assigning a subject to each web page, it just, those right. things don't scale. So you either you need a combination of intelligent extraction tools and getting it from the creators themselves and automatic things like right. GPS uh, um, uh, and uh, 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 date and time. There are lots of things that you can streamline automatically, but people have to turn those on right. and the services have to collect them and not throw them out. Right. So are there any questions from the audience or over? We have a social media question, I think. Um, well, it's sort of a social media question. So the, the question is, um, metadata is certainly useful both for archival and research purposes, and sometimes it helps activists, especially if you're archiving protest footage or violence or something like that. It helps uh, identify you know, perpetrators or it helps uh, document what happened to someone, but there are also services that are being developed for activists to actually strip metadata from photos and videos in order to protect people who may not be wish you know who may not want to be identified where do you think the balance is between stripping metadata but also preserving metadata um, well as I as I showed uh, the the image of obscura cam that is stripping uh, it's not stripping metadata it's stripping visual elements and it's using you know what everyone sees in their camera today you have face detection if you put your thing down you see the little faces and it just blurs that part um, uh, um, I ha two of my graduates who both worked with activist archivists work for human rights organizations one works for witness the other one works for um, human rights watch um, uh, these uh, uh, these organizations are clearly really worried about it's not a matter of someone identifying your boss finding out that you went to a demonstration it's a matter of getting killed or getting your family members uh, murdered because you appeared in something so uh, so so there you know certainly there 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 are serious things about trying to uh, to to uh, to uh, remove certain types of information now uh, you know my my feeling is that uh, as an archivist I would like to save a copy that is completely clear and a copy that is what we call redacted or changed but I worry in certain instances like for example uh, last month uh, witness was hacked repeatedly for weeks at a time. So I, I, you know, I worry about the safety. And when it's a matter of someone's life or death, uh, you know, obviously I move, I go into the position that that uh, it's better to save the redacted version than try to try to save something uh, that has uh, everything clear. Is there another question here? Yeah. Part of your assumption here and, and when we talk about something like Facebook or YouTube or whatever from an archivist standpoint it's fine if YouTube and and whatever are around in five years or ten years but most of these are proprietary systems and if they get changed by the next new thing is there a presumption that everything that's been uploaded to these will be available to the world with all those cool meta tags or not, if, if YouTube disappears, have you lost the archive? Uh, yes, absolutely. This is a serious concern, and I didn't get to go through some of my slides there. But uh, you know, certainly one of our philosophies was that, that libraries and archives should be grabbing these things uh, from these social networks and put, putting them into an environment where they will be saved because we can't count on them being saved. I mean, as it is, they already strip out certain types of information. But what I didn't get a chance to show is that, so that I, I'm sorry to say this about YouTube, but, but um, uh, that uh, you, there, there are certain things that happen on YouTube that, don't, that uh, you're violating the terms of service to grab something. So for example, YouTube allows you to execute a Creative Commons license, but the terms of service say that you can only download something 
for, with a Creative Commons license if the download button appears on your window. And the download button only appears in windows where you can actually download it to edit it, not download to batch download. So you are violating your terms of service. I have a slide, if you go to my slides online, you'll see there's a slide that shows a 1916 uh, film caricaturing Eugene Debs that you are not allowed to download, even though it's a public domain uh, uh, video on YouTube. So, so there, there, there are a lot of, um, uh, yeah, we can't rely on these services to, to keep these things. And that's not their business. We shouldn't rely on them. They are not archival uh, uh, services. They're services providing a, a very topical uh, uh, kind of set of information. It's up to the archives to be uh, uh, saving that, not up to those services. All right, we're going to move on to Dan Russell here now. Not Last but not least, uh, in our uh, panel today, uh, like I said earlier, he's the uh, director of user happiness uh, with, um, with Google. And one of the biggest challenges in an environment in which such massive amounts of new content is being created every day, essentially the entire Encyclopedia Britannica every 20 seconds, um, how do you find the stuff? Um, and I think that idea that the web has opened up an ability to search library in Alexandria, not Virginia, but Alexandria, Egypt, instantly from my desk, is part of the, what has created a truly global community around there. Um, and Dan's going to talk about some of the things that you can do using these new search technologies. Right. Listen, we live in really interesting times. I mean, Paul, you've only scratched the surface of it, right? I mean, it's true we're downloading 100 hours of YouTube every minute, but there's more. Some estimates put it at 1.5 tera words a day. Think about what that means in terms of what we're trying to do as archivists, what we're trying to do as historians, as, as literate people. So let's go to the slides. And I, I want to frame this conversation in terms of a few questions. So the first one I wanted to to talk about was this idea of what does it mean to capture content? We've heard two different approaches to, to capturing content. And we kind of know how to archive texts. We've known since at least Babylonian times that certain forms preserve content of text over time. We know a little bit about capturing images, storing images, uh, videos, and so on. But there's more. There's a lot more. There's the issues that we've talked about, about resolution and transformation and, and the physicality. So if a paper was published, say, 200 years ago, you can go down to the museum archives and pull it out, maybe even look at it if they let you. But when we scan these things, it changes the form. right? All of a sudden, we're in a different universe. And so imagine a world in which Google was run via postcards. <laughs> okay, This is a world you can actually imagine. And it changes the way you think about information retrieval. right? If it takes 30 days, for you to get a Google question back, but it makes archiving really easy, right? <laughs> so you've got an interesting trade-off here. And so I thought this was a ridiculous, this is a funny cartoon. But then I discovered through the miracle of archives that once upon a time, there actually was a question answering service in France, the Mondanium. And this was actually a query, I believe, from 1920. This is a query written in French to the Mondanium service allow 30 days for delivery of answer. But what they did is they actually created this vast card catalog of factoids. And there was a use procedure for people to use to actually take the query, coming in on a postcard or in a letter, and go through those cards and collect together an answer. So this is the Google of 1920s. And in fact, there's a photograph taken back then of the operators. These are literally the computers. All right, here we've got, what, a 10-core processor unit solving some problem inside the Mondanium. So these things exist, but think about what it means to archive this. This is the simplest problem we now have. Trying to archive and capture something like this is also easy because we got technology to handle that stuff. But the vellum and the beauty of that calligraphy is different when it's scanned. Some archivists, when they're looking, working through letters, smell the letter. Because sometimes the letter has, say, perfume on it. 
Sometimes it has carbolic acid on it to try and disinfect it, say, from the Spanish flu of 1918. We lose that when we scan. Whenever we transform something from one form to another, there's inherent change in the properties of that data. So here is a representation of just down the street, the Capitol building. And this is actually in Google Earth. This is a 3D model where the images are photos that have been mapped, texture mapped onto the walls there. But let's zoom in. What happened to the trees? You have to understand any capturing of data of a physical artifact necessarily involves a transformation, often a reduction, often a physical change in the way we represent. Second question to think about. OK, Russell, you've given us some problems. This panel is full of problems. How are we going to address these things? <laughs> so what can we do? One of the things I want to propose is we need to understand what's possible in changing our relationship with the archive. What I mean by that is what can we do with the stuff that's in the archive? I'll give you a couple examples here. We know how to capture static or sort of physical artifacts like documents and so on. What do we do about this modern ephemera? So for example, my phone, I can point it at a building and query the building. I can query the photograph of that building. And it will tell me, oh, by the way, here's the website for Stanford's Hoover Tower. If I do that same query tomorrow, it may give me a different answer, right? Because the website has changed. So all of a sudden, we live in a very squishy, moving world. Here's another kind of ephemera. This is Google Maps from a couple years ago. Maybe you remember this, maybe not. But one of the features of it was that little tiny triangular icon there was an interactor widget that would then slide that drawer to the left. Uh-oh, now we're dealing with animation and interaction in a data space which is constantly changing and evolving. Because you know, that's a picture of San Diego. It doesn't look like that anymore. Or there's another kind of interaction widget where you can fly over with a god's eye view of this entire landscape. That's gone. The code is gone. The interaction is gone. I don't know. I might be the only person with this image. So we're in an interesting world where data is not a static thing anymore. Objects are not solitary instances of solids. Here, for example, is Google. And you've probably done a query like this. You've done a query like o, 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 and see the suggestions that appear below that? That list represents the other queries that other people are making worldwide based on the head query that you just gave. That list constantly changes as fads, fashion, and interest move. What does it mean to capture that? Trust me, if you were a historian from the year 2000 looking back at now, you would really like to see that list. We don't capture that list. You can also look, though, at different kinds of archives from the past. So this is a graph of three different terms of famous scientists or science fiction creatures from the past where we have retroactively gone back through the books archive, pulled out all the text terms, and done an n-gram analysis. What that means is you can now see the instance of frequency of the term Frankenstein over time or Einstein over time. This was not in the original archive, but it is an ex post facto analysis of the content in the archive. What this means is we can change our relationship with the content of the archive. If, here's a photograph taken by my office mate. Using Google search by image, I can actually search out where that is. What this means is you can take a photograph of an, an image in an archive that no one has seen, say, in 50 years. And if someone else has taken a photograph of that on the our internet someplace, we can find it. So in this case, if you do a search by image, this will tell you this is Red Rocks Canyon right outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. This fundamentally shifts our relationship with archival materials because we can now search for it in ways that were not possible before. We can combine resources together. This is Google Earth with one of the Rams Ramsey maps showing the Lewis and Clark motion in their expedition across the United States. But this is with the map that they created overlaid with the temporal extent of all their campsites during their entire voyage. We can blend archival materials together to create and synthesize new kinds of information. 
Google's Cultural Institute, for example, does a lot of capturing of archival material, in this case, from a museum. And one of the things we do is not just take the object itself, and I'm going to focus here on Van Gogh's self-portrait, but look what we can do by the scan operation. We can zoom in and zoom in again. That kind of representation gets you closer to the reality of that object and the very shape of the blobs of the paint and the brush strokes in intimate detail in a way that you can't do. They won't let you get that close. You can't do that in reality, except unless you've got the white gloves and special permission from the Pope. When we start to think about these kinds of things, we can start to combine archival data and archival content in interesting new ways. So this is an outline of the city of Rome. I don't know if you've been to Rome, but you probably didn't know that the boundary of Rome is actually a fractal. And it's got this kind of very great ins and outs and imaginations and, and protrusions and all kinds of things. This is a, an example of taking a satellite archival imagery, overlaying it with road data, overlaying that with boundary data. We start to see these new constellations and combinations and reappraisals of content. If you think about it, no, we're in an interesting age. Film, video, audio, text, all these different kinds of content are blossoming rapidly. I already said 100 hours of video uploaded to YouTube per minute. Think about your domain of expertise. You might be a professional knitter, or you might be a professional librarian, or you might be a professional doctor. Trust me, there is now more YouTube video about your domain of expertise than you can watch in the rest of your life. We are at the end of an age where you could actually go read all the literature in your expertise. I might have been the last person in that their way in computer science. I no longer can. You no longer can. We no longer can collectively as a culture understand our own culture in an interesting, deep way. For example, this is a question I, I ask a lot of people in my search classes. This is a photograph taken of a house built in downtown Palo Alto about 1919 or so. And the question is, can you find an aerial image of this house taken before 1977? How hard can that be? How hard can that be? When I ask literally thousands of people this question, they all say, I have no clue. And I've had friends of mine, engineers, software engineers, research scientists, thousands of people have said, I can't find the answer to this. But the truth is, Google Earth already has this in it. But you need to know what's possible to do with the archive. You see what I'm saying? It's not enough just to capture. It's not enough just to represent. You need to understand what you can do. So that slider you see at the top there is a slider of time. And you can go back, and every archived image that's in this location can be accessed. And this is an image from 1948, an aerial image of that house taken well before 1977. You see what I'm getting at? We live in an age where the archive, where the stored content is growing rapidly, and our relationship to it can change fundamentally. So what do we need to do? What kinds of research do we need to think about? I think there's three things. We need to think about how to improve our capture, think about what it means to have indexing changes, and improve our metadata, both in its representational adequacy and its preservation, just as Howard was saying. So let me give you an example here. If you know anything about typography, you probably remember that back when the Declaration of Independence was written, people would write the letter S, what would look like the, an F. So it, looked, it was called the long S form. So if you go into Google Books a couple years ago and did a search for fave, the word fave, which is relatively recent, you'll find lots of instances of God fave the queen. And it was an OCR problem, because the, the OCR scanner would see that long S to say, oh, that's an F. But now, ex post facto, we can rewrite the OCR routines and reparse that correctly. Okay? So what, we're, what are we doing? Are we throwing away the archive? We're improving it. We're increasing the accuracy of it because we didn't understand that shift. So one of the things I want to bring out here is that it's an interesting time in another way. Google's index is, in many ways, sort of the chief artifact of the technology of Google. Good luck archiving that. 
it is a constantly evolving, constantly changing, fluid situation. So even though it may be one of the chief cultural artifacts of our time, I literally can't give it to you. I cannot do it. No engineer can do it because once you start copying the bits from one end to the other end, by the time you get to, say, halfway through, the first bits will have changed. It's like trying to archive a bunny rabbit. You can freeze dry it. It's not the same, right? <laughs> furthermore, furthermore, you really can't use it in the same way. So a lot of the computational artifacts we have, like Google Index or documents or computer games or whatever, are data plus computation. Okay? There is a piece of code somewhere that interacts with it, runs it, and select so like the Google Map example I showed. It runs it with respect to a large data set and a computational framework and an interface. So we live in an interesting time where we're trying to capture things that are very different. The metadata that goes along with all of this is more than just we've been thinking about it, just the metadata or the data, data about the data, which is the canonical definition of, of what metadata means. It also is the history of how data is transformed and changed. So Howard gave this example of uploading to YouTube and some stuff, data, metadata gets transformed or stripped out or altered. This happens to all data. So here's an example of Las Vegas taken from Google Earth, and I took this time slider back a few years. This is the strip, believe it or not. This is downtown Las Vegas. This is more modern rendition here. One thing to understand is that as these images are brought in and archived, they are also transformed. The metadata has to capture that transformation as well. So it's not enough to just be able to capture the data, but also capture the metadata and all changes that happen to it. So for example, here's a, a, an application you can launch that will actually monitor a location on the planet. It will set up basically a camera in the sky, in the virtual sky, that will let you know through email or, or message when that spot changes. So if you're monitoring deforestation, you can watch that particular piece of forest and Google will tell you when that piece of forest changes. Okay? Archive that. Do you see where I'm going? These are very difficult things to understand and capture. And yet, we live in a time when you can, for example, here, get the data, in this case, for unemployment rate in Maryland over the past 20 years. And I can now compare it. I can now start to look at other data from other parts of the archives. So I think one of the things we're seeing is that we have these issues about capture and resolution, physicality, data representation, and so on. But we live in extraordinarily interesting times where this kind of stuff is out there, and it's possible for all of us to access it, access the archives, access the richness of data in the world in ways that were not possible before. And that's exciting. Thank you. Now, uh, do we have a question for Dan? I have a couple, but uh, if there's something in the audience, we've got. Um... Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm slightly more on the overwhelming side than on the heifer side about the possibilities. You're overwhelming? Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking from a practical point of view, and I, I kind of basically asking uh, the whole panel more on what this all means in practical terms for, let's say, for us as a, as a news broadcast, or broadcast news organization in terms of archiving these content. I give you just a very simple example of, um, let's say, still photographs. When we upload a photo album of a major event, we juggle with the decision of where to upload. And my, uh, an example of what I decide is, is the best ways on Facebook at this point or Google Plus, yes, we use Google Plus also for photo archives. Um, and instead, not on our own website because there's a lot of resources involved in, in uploading these. My question is, what would you advise for you know, news organizations to think ahead about that? Is, that? is that the question of what should be archived and how it should be indexed and who should be involved? Because there's a lot of resource question involved here, as, as you pointed out. Um, so there's, you're right, there's a lot of interesting choices here. And um, I'm going to give you two answers. Um, the answer 
for right now would be uh, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, storage is effectively infinite and free. Now, as Howard points out, it's often also held by corporations. So organizations like Facebook or Twitter or Google or Microsoft or Yahoo, whatever, all do these things for a particular reason. So if you're thinking about this in the longer term, you want to sort of invest in something that you think is going to be around for a while. I mean, but that's true of libraries too, right? You always want to invest in a place, in an organization that you think is going to be around for a while. Now, let me give you the second answer, which is around for a really long time. What's the 1,000 year answer? Right? One of the beauties of that piece of calligraphy I showed you is it's you know, many hundreds of years old. We can read documents from, say, year 2000 BC. Right? So that's a 4,000 year old document that we can read from Egypt. So there's a certain way in which physicality beats it all. On the other hand, we live in a world of trade-offs. So there's no simple quick answer for this other than to say, you know, you've got to go with your gut on your intuitions about what's going to be around for the duration. I don't know what the thousand year answer is. I wish I knew. Uh, you know, thousand years ago, our technological base was so interestingly different that it's very difficult to go from here to there. I can't tell you it's going to be out 10 years, right? Our professions will change a lot in the next 10 years. So I don't know what to tell you for the thousand year answer. But as a futurist, I should have an answer. But I, think, I don't think there is an answer to the question. I think, uh, and we're going to ask some yeah. personal advice questions like this. I think the understanding of what is the end use. So if you're a news organization and your primary use is to provide the public with critical information in a semi-real-time scenario, then you want to, number one, get it out through your traditional channels, your website, your broadcast, your newspaper, whatever that is. But you also want to try to get it in front of people. Because the expectation is now that I'm not going to go out and look for news. News is going to come to me. Um, it's going to show up on my Facebook feed, or it's going to show up on my Twitter feed, or it's going to be on a Tumblr. And that those news organizations that really want to disseminate information have to understand that they are now have, uh, responsible for putting that, whether it's an image or a piece of news or whatever, in front of the people. They can't expect the people to come to them to get it. And, and so in terms of meeting your responsibility as a news organization, then it is constantly changing. What are the most effective tools for distribution today? However, you also have the responsibility to be maintaining and archiving your content for yourself. And that's where you don't want to rely on outside organizations, outside corporations. It's the news organization's responsibility to create an archive to curate that content to determine what's important and what's not important and to maintain that library on your own that you are then migrating into the future as each new operating system or each new technological development happens. And I think the challenge for individuals now is that we have to find ways of migrating our personal content. In the old days, you took your camera, you took a picture, you got your film developed, you got your prints, you stuck them in a book. Right? And, and you had now completed your archiving. You know, if you were really good, you would write the little note next to it that said, Mom, Easter, 1972. Um, I, you know, talking about the companies that are going to be here and not going to be here, you know, when the digital photography first came around, I said, well, I'm going to go with a company that I'm going to be guaranteed is going to be here 10 years from now. So I uploaded all my content to Kodak. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Right. OK, so I didn't make the right choice. But at the time that I uploaded to Kodak, Shutterfly and you know, Bumblebee and Tumblr and none of that stuff existed. Uh, so th those questions, you now, as individuals, have to take that responsibility to say, I have to put work in to creating a system for managing and maintaining my own archive, whether it's audio or pictures of, pro of protests or whatever. So personal advice to the, the audience out there, how do, they, how do they archive their audio today? Um, I think this is particularly tough for broadcast television and radio industries because they're, um, they're transitioning to a lot more web-based production and it's really hard when you don't already have those systems in place and you're working with systems that are decades old to be able to get content to that many places at one time without like I said, having your you know, reporters or producers logging into multiple locations, making these decisions constantly about whether they should go to SoundCloud or to Google Plus or to Facebook or where, wherever it's going to be. Um, 
And so I think that, you know, I said when I was speaking that the, there are best practices for preservation and we can all follow those. And I didn't mean to oversimplify it because where it gets complicated, you know, we've established that corporations own the, the majority of, of storage out there. And there's the Library of Congress and maybe the Internet Archive. There's locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe is another one um, that you might be interested in looking into. Um, and those are great, but I think the I think and the and the the, the um, challenge of corporations holding our storage is absolutely a, a, a valid one. But it gets really tricky then when you when you want to navigate those different options effectively because it's a lot of work to engage with any single one of them right now. Um, and I think that's changing, but you know on a day to day basis, it's really tough because there isn't a thousand year answer. And I think. In a newsroom, you are on deadline, you need to move quickly, you don't have the time to put it in every single place that you might want it to be in front of audiences and safe. Um, but I, I would say from my experience in working with journalists in news, newsrooms on these, on these questions and their editors saying, what's going to happen 10 years from now when we need to go back and find this stuff and it's not there, um, that sometimes it is best to try to um, you're going to know what's best for your organization, but to identify the, the handful or a couple or three places that you think the most people will see this that will be around for a relatively significant period of time. Um, and you know, I think ideally if it's public material, that's a place like the Internet Archive that has a dedicated mission to saving things for you in a way that a corporation won't. Um, but you know, given the server that your newsroom may be maintaining, you know, Amazon Web Services might be safer than that. So. I, that, that's what I would advise is to just try to put, put balance the amount of effort that you need to put in knowing that, that these web services are changing, that they all are being harnessed and tethered in ways that ideally, you know, I've talked to so many people who want to be able to upload to SoundCloud and Dropbox and their local server and NPR's, you know, uh, server at the same time and they just can't right now. Um, but 10 years from now, everything is going to be really different. Now, Howard, if someone is out there and they're in, in, at an event, at a news event, whether it's an Occupy event or a protest or something else, how do they know where to do it? I, I'm, I'm videotaping the police beating my cousin's head in right now, you know, as they're trying to clear, you know, McPherson Square. What do I do with it? Okay. Well, first of all, I think what I would like to see and what we talked about a lot in Activist Archivist but didn't have the resources to actually do is, for, is to create an app that allows you to pre-fill in certain things, Creative Commons license, who I am, to whether you want the time and date and location on it, all of that stuff. And I want to send it to these services so that all you have to do is, in the heat of the moment, you're there, you click, and it takes it, uh, whether it's still or moving image or audio, it takes it and it uploads it to all of those services with that metadata attached and with your name or a pseudonym or whatever, or your association, uh, the date, time, place, all of that stuff uploads it along with a Creative Commons license saying how it can be used. I mean, that's the, the uh, to me, that is the real answer. And it's actually not, if you know how to write apps, it's not a very sophisticated thing to do. All right, now get to work. When are you, uh, when are you guys going <laughs> to do that for us? But, but let me follow up on, 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 on the, the lar broader question that we've been saying. I think, I think Paul's absolutely right about how to push that out and, uh, uh, in, in relation to that question, how, how you need to get it out. But I do think that the responsibility for migrating things to different file formats uh, that ends up being a difficult kind of thing. That is not something for an individual to do if an individual has a really lot of material. That is something for a cultural institution to do. Um, and, and as Dan said, you know, th there's a big difference between these cultural institutions that, la that are designed to last for a very long time. As my colleague uh, in the Audiovisual Conservation uh, Center uh, at uh, the Library of Congress says, our responsibility is to keep things for 200 years after the end of the republic. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, um, it, it ha to have uh, to really keep things for a long time. And 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 it is very clear. We work with a lot of community organizations, and certainly the attitude in in Occupy was, oh, I just want to keep things on my hard disk and save them, and that's the only place they should be. That is not a tenable long-range solution, at least in the in the near future. Migration it takes a lot of resources, a lot of thought, and an ongoing commitment over a long period of time to change file formats because, again, as everyone who has used a word processor knows, you're changing those all the time. You know, you, the JPEG images that we have floating around today are probably not going to be viewable 10 or 20 years from now uh, unless they're migrated to a different file format. Yeah. So, Is there another question out in the audience here or up there? Have we gotten in? Ira has a social media question. We'll go to the live question first. Hi, I wonder, I wonder if you have some advice for journalists when we are covering events like this Occupy. And usually we are in the first row. We will have the best picture. We will have the best video. And sometimes maybe we are not doing a very good job when we identify this. And sometimes it's very fast and you just upload this. You just post this on Twitter. And you are not doing a very good job identifying this. And it's very hard to find this information for the future. And it's even harder for the um, audience to find these photos or these videos. Do you have some advice for journalists covering events? Well, I, I, I guess, uh, you know, again, everything that I have done in the past and all the studies I, I've looked at or performed tell me that the time to try to do that type of identification is as close as possible to the time it was taken. You know, one idea, just off the top of my head, is if you, if you or your news service or, or, or whatever had a, a, a page uh, where you uploaded a web, website, web page, where you upload your photo, photos to and you ask people who were there to contribute information to tag it with the names of the people or some other identifying uh, identification um, marks. But again, you're going to get the best information for that like right after it happens. You're not going to get a lot of very good information until much later. Though we we do have tools for doing that for much later. In the Netherlands, uh, they have taken uh, photographs uh, from their archives, and they've uh, created a game, both photographs and videos. Uh, uh, it's a game called Waista, um, where people play and earn points by identifying people in a photograph, in an older photograph, or uh, in an older video. And there's this high degree of competition between people to earn more points by identifying these. And the way that it works is, uh, I think it takes three different people identifying the, the same person with the same name before it becomes part of the, uh, uh, the system uh, as, as, a, as an official tag in the system. And so you're, you, you try, it's, it becomes a competition, but it's also, collaboration in the sense that people have to agree on something. Now the, to go to your question, too, there's a very interesting example of that with uh, the White House uh, photographer, Pete Sousa, who travels with the president constantly and has, you know, you've seen all those professional photographers. They have six cameras around their neck with lenses like this big and everything, and they have to take, the, they take raw files, have to take them back. So he has started traveling with a cell phone with the camera on it. So he has now started taking pictures with his cell, he's got, you know, a million dollars worth of cameras hung around his neck, and he's taking pictures with his cell phone so that he can Instagram them out immediately. Uh, and so he's distributing these pictures, you know, because he has unique access, and he is sometimes playing the role of, a, of, of the eyes of the public, even though the press photographers might not be there. And so he's using his cheap little phone camera to get the image out immediately and then putting up the big camera and taking the picture, which he then goes back and processes and puts out and becomes part of the permanent archive. So it's almost... There's almost two different realities going right now because you have 
the mobile distribution system for Instagram and things like that, which instantly go out, and then you have the higher resolution, more um, uh, preservable content, um, which is used in a more traditional way. So it, it, journalists are facing this challenge constantly. Do I want to get it out immediately? Do I want to make it good? Do I curate it? Do I just put it out there? And then how do I find it? Well, I was going to add a little bit to that, which is in my role as a futurist, that's going to happen to the big cameras too. Yeah. I mean, so I actually think it, it, part of the answer to your question is um, slightly different than, than Howard's answer, which would be, if I was a journalist doing this, I would turn on, burn on the video, the time, burn on the GPS location, so it can't be removed. Okay. You know what I mean by burning it into the image, right? So it's not a piece of metadata that can be, say, edited by a metadata editor. Just saying. It's one of those things that it's, you could, yes, I could remove it. It's a real pain to remove it. But editing metadata out is very, very simple to do. Okay? So you see what I'm getting at? That way it cannot be ex removed from, and I, yes, it may mess up the corporate logo <laughs> when you broadcast the video. <laughs> Tough, right? It actually is a great way to, to mark these things in a way that's very difficult to alter. Uh, but I think going to, to, to Paul's camera point, you know, I, why don't those big expensive cameras with big expensive processors in them take a small resolution thing with a GPS and the time and upload it automatically? I mean, it, you can see this is Hello, the- Hello, Canon? <laughs> <laughs> Write that patent right, right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's sort of the inevitable progression of these kinds of technologies as they get cheaper, faster, and they merge. Yep. Okay. So cameras merged into cell phones, which we almost never use for phones anymore. Right. Right? We use them for calculators. Oh, that merged in too. We use them for picture views. That merged in. You know, see where this is going. So I think Paul's invention, it's his, <laughs> is, is going to be part of the answer to this. Uh, Ira, we had a question over here. So uh, we heard uh, that you know, we don't have the answers. And, uh, but you're all very curious people, and if you had a, just a, a, a dream team of researchers at your disposal, I'm wondering if each of you might articulate a really good researchable question that riffs off of some of the things that you've talked about today. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one because I would do the thousand year question. Uh, and so I, I really like this 200 years post-republic. Um, I'm gonna say a thousand years post-republic, right? And I, and I think it's actually, a lot of people have been working on this kind of problem. And there are various complex proposals for making virtual machines that will be forever able to interpret PDF files in Acrobat formats and so on. And I think there is a, a germ of a good idea there, but I don't know how to carry it forward to a thousand years. So that's the way I would put together a crack team of people. I'd lock them up in Silicon Valley, slide pizzas under the door, <laughs> and say, you got a thousand years. No, 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 you got to deliver it before then. But that would be the goal. I can go next. Um, it sort of piggybacks on what you had to say. Uh, it, it's, it's also related to the thousand year question, but I think even more, so let's try to give them a problem they can solve in, a, in like a couple of weeks. Oh, I'm an optimist, um, come on. Okay, right, no, I'm right there with you, I'm right there with you. Um, but, and I don't know that this is solvable either, but at the very least those PDFs we could print out copies of and put in the shoe boxes and save them in the closet. Um, we were talking about this earlier at lunch. What about all of the amazing visualizations that we're seeing in the news all the time and playing with and interacting with and experiencing differently depending on who we are, where we are, what we care about, what we're reading? Um, I think that those, you know, a screenshot is one thing. We talked about screencasts where um, the person, the, the, whether it's, you know, team of reporters, coders, uh, designers who built it, talk about the decisions they made in building it. I don't know that that would be more valuable than just watching a random person, you know, interacting with it on the New York Times website. But, um, you know, when you take that in comparison to, to a newsprint from 300 years ago and the decisions that went into writing that article and producing it and distributing it, um, we both have the opportunity to save a lot more information. But short of building virtual boxes that run this code and do this fancy stuff down the road, there must be a, um, a slightly less unwieldy way of saving those artifacts and the way that's, that we're interacting with them right now. Because otherwise, they, they disappear, matter of days. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I, uh, uh, I would even try to formulate one of those types of questions. I've been on so many groups that have tried to tackle things, uh, you know, for the kind of 
a thing that Dan has suggested in 1998. We put together people uh, uh, at the Getty to talk about uh, how we could save digital information that would last 10,000 years. Uh, you know, and, and came up with wild ideas. I'm, I, you know, I, those were wild ideas. And I, I just don't, I, I'm much more grounded, as, as Anne was saying, in doable kinds of things. And I've got dozens of these doable projects that people are working on. I guess the, the, the even when I try to formulate something, I change it into something doable. So, you know, one we kind... We have the same problem. We yeah. need more of his optimism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, one kind of thing... Okay, uh, a friend of mine has uh, been doing all these studies that say uh, how often bits flip. And they flip all the time. And um, uh, how can we keep bits from flipping? Uh, in our storage. But, you know, for me, I don't really care. I would turn that into the question uh, rather than how do we keep bits from flipping, how to uh, change it to the question, how do we keep bits from flipping where it really matters, like in the header of a file where one bit flipping will completely uh, change, make, read, render the entire file unreadable, whereas in the content of a two-hour video, one bit flipping is a dot on the screen or a, a roll or something like that. So I would change it into that, which is a much more doable kind of uh, question. How do we keep header bits from flipping? If, if, if I had a, a, a single uh, research project, it would be understanding how we can take some of the technologies that are used today for semantic analysis of text-based communications like text messages and Twitter um, which are being used by corporations to understand what the sentiment is. You know, is, is the sentiment after a big Coke ad launches, is, does the sentiment get more positive or does the sentiment get less positive? When they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on these algorithms to an analyze sentiment. I would love to find a way to, to use some of that technology to analyze the sentiment of personal communications and allow people to find a way to share and save the communications that matter. For example, you know, I always go back to Ken Burns' Civil War documentary, where they went back and they found all those wonderful letters from soldiers in the field to their families back home. And they were able to tell a story based on those letters. Well, what are those letters for the Iraq War? What are those letters from the soldiers from Afghanistan? How do we preserve the communications as they were communicating with their loved ones back home in this ephemera of Twitter and text messages and emails? How do you collect that so that 150 years from now, when Ken Burns' great, 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 great grandson decides to make a documentary on Afghanistan, he can find that communication and give us some insight into the personal cost of fighting in that war. And, and to me, that's a, that's a great lost opportunity. All right, you guys have been incredibly patient. We're wrapping up now. We're going to have the uh, lightning round where we ask each of our panelists uh, for what they think is the... Uh, the greatest opportunity we have as we go forward in trying to document the digital age today. And we're going to start at uh, Dan and work our way back. The greatest opportunity for documenting the digital age. Well, I'm going to have to go with film or video or some version of that. Um, and the reason is, is because it's kind of the, uh, and I mean this in the best possible way, the lowest common denominator. Right. And the reason is that if you have a, the world's most interesting computational thing, three-dimensional shaded graphics, rotating sound, you know, all this stuff, you can capture it to first order on video. The chances of that code running in five years, almost nil. But the video will still run. Or the 35 millimeter sprocket film, you can still project that. So that's what I would go with, video. Power? Um, I, I would uh, uh, actually, uh, in some ways, build on, on what Dan said. Uh, but I divide this into two pieces, um, uh, saving the content as one thing and saving the experience as another. And saving the content is something that we've, uh, we're making a lot of progress on and uh, have really good ideas and you know, good guidelines, and we're moving along on that. 
saving the experience is closer to what, what, what Dan was saying. Um, uh, that is the idea that we need, we need to find uh, good ways to actually document, uh, for example, he was talking about the uh, um, uh, 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 data plus computation. Uh, I would say data plus computation plus the interface. Oh, yeah. Right? You know, uh, it, you, right. right. And Absolutely. all of that together. But again, as yeah. you say, the best way to save that is with a video. It could be a digital video. Yeah, yeah. You know, but the best way to save that is, is that way. And we've been doing this. I, work on a, I, I worked on a project 10 years ago that, took, uh, that, that was a technology project from 1984, the Electronic Cafe International, this great uh, 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 telepresence project where it was so clear that saving the actual material from that was less valuable mm -hmm. than saving the interviews with the people interacting with it at the time mm -hmm. and them talking about it. Same things with video games, with, with other things. Having that type of video documentation, I'm entirely in agreement. I agree with them too, but I'm gonna try to let my, the optimism maybe outweigh a little bit more of the pragmatism. Um, and just focus on the, the greatest opportunity, I think, is for the industries that haven't caught up with technology in the way that, that, that technology clearly carries itself and that certain other um, you know, web services, absolutely, but certain other industries are catching up to perhaps faster than others. And the incredible ability that will be, uh, capabilities that will be afforded to those industries, be they broadcast, um, be, be it healthcare, be it some of these, um, uh, places where, you know, it takes a while to hire people. It takes a while to figure out that you should be hiring developers, um, computers, software engineers, computer developers, uh, uh, over other types of people, um, or in addition, ideally, to other types of people. And, you know, we're only talking about a, a couple of decades here. So I just, I'm really excited for what will happen when some of these, these traditionally siloed industries are able to finally overcome that. Um, and I think that yeah, they'll be able to do so much, and they're, they're, they're not quite yet. Well, the closing thought for me will be uh, a quote from Clay Shirky, a professor uh, in New York, he, who talks about cognitive surplus, um, which is the combined willingness of people to create a common asset, uh, Wikipedia being sort of the most obvious uh, example of that. And that, that cognitive surplus that's out there right now, and this new community that's com created around the web culture allows people to apply themselves to create something. And I think that if we can find a way to apply that cognitive surplus to the challenge of understanding how we preserve the digital present, that we'll find a solution. Um, I want to thank the panelists today. I think they did a fantastic job. Can we hit a round of applause for them? I want to thank you all for, for joining us um, for the panel here. and I. Um, Truly thankful to the University of Maryland for creating this Future of Information Alliance. Uh, I think it's important that we look at the future, and I'm going to turn it back over now to the two founders, Ira Chinoy and Allison Druin. Thank you, Paul. Just a last reminder about the wrap up, uh, in terms of wrapping up. Um, tomorrow, um, from 10 to noon, um, at the University of Maryland and McKeldin Library, we will have our last live stream of our Future of the Past events for this week. Please join us. Come to the fia.umd.edu uh, website and, um, and join us for this last part of it. And we will be actually reviewing um, the words of many of our uh, futurists today, um, as well as in our the past few days. And we're looking forward to having all of you join us together. Thank you again. Thank you all.